fact, it is time to make network and security simpler and more flexible. Ariaka helps enterprises modernize, optimize, and transform their network and security experience with Ariaka Unified SASE as a service. The only solution that delivers performance, agility, simplicity, and security without trade-offs. Ariaka Unified SASE as a service is a purpose-built, cloud-based offering that securely connects users and applications anywhere in the world. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Ariaka, that's A-R-Y-A-K-A, to learn more. Do your end users always, and I mean always, without exception, work on company-owned devices and IT-approved apps? I didn't think so. So my next question is, how do you keep your company's data safe when it's sitting on all those unmanaged apps and devices? 1Password has an answer to this question, Extended Access Management. 1Password Extended Access Management helps you secure every sign-in for every app on every device because it solves the problems traditional IAM and MDM can't touch. Check it out at securityweekly.com forward slash 1Password. And we're back to Black Hat 2024, broadcasting out of the Four Seasons. This is our last interview for the day and for the show. So we're going to push through and hopefully have the best conversation yet. I'm with uh, Rakesh Nair. He's senior vice president and engineering and pro- senior vice president engineering and product. I read everything that's on the prompt at a company called Devo. Rakesh, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Rakesh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, how you got into cybersecurity. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty interesting space, and I think as as was finishing my college degree. One of the areas that I wanted to get into was cybersecurity. Uh, so I've been in the space for roughly 25 years now. Um, currently at Devo, prior to that, I was uh, CEO and founder of a company called Cognos, which uh, focused on uh, autonomous threat investigations. Okay. Uh, before that, I was at RSA Net Witness. I ran all of the engineering teams for uh, the entire SIM, ADR, and DR portfolio at Net Witness. And um, different roles before that, I was the chief architect for uh, Juniper Firewalls and VPNs. Uh, and a bunch of uh, uh, different companies before that, but all in the cybersecurity space. Gotcha. So how'd you find your way to Devo? Uh, so Devo uh, came through an acquisition of the company that I was mentioning earlier called Cognos. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Devo was looking for a threat hunting platforms to augment the offering. And so we were one of the only ones out there that did autonomous threat detection, so threat investigation. So, uh, so I think the acquisition happened in April 2022. Okay. And been with Jivo ever since. Great. So, um, how are you finding the show here this week? Do you guys have a booth out there? Oh, we do have a booth out there, yes. I think a lot of traffic, a lot of uh, uh, interesting new startups, and uh, a lot of technology innovations compared to two, three years back. I think there's a lot of uh, new technology being introduced in the cybersecurity space. We're happy to see some of those things are happening. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I've I, barely been on the floor. I've been out there a couple times yesterday and today because I've been in here doing interviews and other things. But, it, you know, there's always the what's the trends, what's the buzz of the year, and, and obviously AI is mm-hmm. everywhere. But beyond that, what I think I've been noticing is a lot more companies that are trying to shift the focus away from vulnerabilities and starting to focus on the threat. Which I think overall is a good thing. Yep. And um, obviously there's probably some overlap there with the in, the intelligent application of AI to threat hunting, yes. threat modeling. I, what are you guys doing in that space? Yeah, and I, uh, b- before I touch on the AI part, I think there's kind of start off with the trend space. And I think there are three trends that I'm observing. Mm-hmm. One of them is around data explosion. I think more and more companies want to do data-driven decision-making. Okay. As a side effect of that, I think there's a lot more data coming to security data platforms. Mm-hmm. So that's one trend. The other one I'm observing is around data convergence. It is not as prevalent yet, but there is a few companies who are trying to bring in all of the data into one place and then have vertical applications built on top of it. So for instance, security applications or IT ops, uh, ops uh, applications, et cetera, or even BI to be built from that single uh a monolith of uh, data that mm-hmm. they can manage. Uh, and the third trend that I'm seeing is around uh, technology conversions in the security space, mm-hmm. uh, especially with uh, respect to threat detection, incident response, et cetera. Right. Um, so I think one of the things we do at Devo is uh, we are envisioning a platform, uh, kind of a security data platform that combines uh, the SIM, the SOAR, uh, data orchestration pieces, mm-hmm. um, as well as um, uh, UEBA and some of the AI-driven investigation pieces all into one stack 
so that um, the security analysts can actually take a, advantage of it and move much faster and smarter. Uh, so in that context, I think last year when I was here, I saw a lot of uh, AI, especially specifically around Gen AI, uh, as Gen AI as the core of the platform and then doing some aspect of security or the other. But I think this time I see a little bit more of applied uh, uh, Gen AI, uh, which is my belief is that uh, Gen AI is going to be subsumed into these technology layers and kind of augment what is being done across the technology stack, as opposed to being a standalone uh, model of you know, here is a Gen AI interface and interact with it. But I think it will kind of be subsumed into different layers, kind of weaving intelligence at different layers to make the system much more smarter and available uh, from a uh, for, from a security perspective. Do you think that's uh, because AI was prematurely hyped or it is just another uh, I, I look at it as search, yeah. rotation of the hype cycle, as it were? Uh, I, last year was the hype cycle, for sure. It was at the, at the peak, I think. But uh, And people were trying to figure out practical applications of the, uh, sure. uh, of the maturity of uh, LLMs. Uh, but I think this year it was more pragmatic use cases, more applied use cases that I'm seeing, uh, uh, which, which I think it's, it's a good evolution. I, I always thought that it is imbibing some of this into, into the technology stack is a much more powerful concept as opposed to building something with the Gen AI piece as it's at its core. It's, uh, <laughs> this is the first time on air, probably between RSA and Black Hat that actually said AI. So I'm throwing up a little bit in my mouth right now, but um, but it seemed to make sense because what I'm hearing you say is we're getting beyond the hype and people are actually figuring out what it can and can't do. Exactly. It's not the you know sky is falling, it, the world's coming to end if the bad guys get their hands on it, and on conversely, the good guys, the people that are fighting for the defensive side, are figuring out the limitations and what can we do with it. What's the best way to use it because at the end of the day it's another tool exactly it's another piece of technology that's trying to solve the puzzle of security yeah uh, security in general yes so um my background is from the dod and vosec learning the risk equation being risk is a and i'm oversimplifying a function of vulnerability threat and what we used to call countermeasures um, and I, I, I talk a lot about on our show about everybody's focused on the vulnerability, everybody's focused on the vulnerability. So I'm actually encouraged that there's more attention to the threat because to me, that's more closer to what security is. Mm -hmm. You do all the hopefully blocking and tackling, hardening, changing defaults, removing unnecessary services, all that traditional stuff. And it, at the end of the day, you're watching diligently you know, in a military context, the wall, but the network, the data, the flows, the repositories, and you're looking for something weird happening. Agree, disagree? No, I totally agree. I mean, there is, there is kind of basic security hygiene practices, which I put vulnerability management and mm -hmm. version upgrades and some of those things into that bucket of things, which is sure. uh, table stakes uh, for any company to do. Um, but then the, the next level is around, I think, as we look at data to be the source of more decision making, mm -hmm. as we're looking at data to provide us context for what is happening from a security perspective, um, that here becomes extremely uh, important. Uh, and I think uh, there's a lot more companies that I see are starting to use MSSPs, mm -hmm. um, much more than I've observed in the past uh, two, three years ago, uh, for example. So they, they are feeling the need for uh, doing, from a security perspective, mm -hmm. collecting the data, uh, being being having the data in maybe multiple tiers as well. Mm -hmm. uh, what is kind of the immediate data that I need to look at a threat and understand it pretty quickly? Mm -hmm. What is it that I need for a deeper IR uh, process to pull in additional context into it? Mm -hmm. uh, so some of the things I talked around data orchestration goes straight to that uh, problem that we're trying to solve. And there's, there's also been standalone products that have tried to do that filtering and routing sure. of that data for you. But I think over a period of time, uh, as the data is growing exponentially, but the budgets are relatively flat, uh, people are trying to figure out within the same budget constraints, how do I manage this data? So what is hot data? What is warm? What should be cold? Mm -hmm. And then being able to automatically transfer the data from cold to hot if you're doing an IR, for instance, okay, for the six, three, three months of uh, period, I want all of the data to be in warm or hot so I can do queries and understand what the context of the attack is. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is definitely happening. And I, the other one I'm looking at is, 
not necessarily just from an LLM perspective, but there are reasoning engines and agents or agent technologies that we can deploy uh, that can interact with the data and understand the data. So the one thing we did at Cognos was uh, it was a, a Q&A engine that interacts with the data mm-hmm. as if a security analyst would interact with the data. So try and ask the question. So almost like um, if you use a tax software as an example, Trevor Tax, did you buy a house last year? If the answer is no, it won't ask any more questions of uh, of, of you. Mm-hmm. Um, but if the answer is yes, then they say, okay, what was the down payment? What is your... So they're trying to figure out so it's a similar piece of technology that we found at Cognos, which is also being integrated into the Devo stack mm-hmm. that will interact with the data on behalf of the analyst and be able to understand and contextualize, not just enrich when an alert fires, but to investigate the... Uh, so for, 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 for example, if someone is running a, a Python script and connecting to your S3 bucket to, to Amazon and changing your S3 bucket permissions, mm-hmm. you want the system to understand and tell you the full narrative of what's happening. Right. So that level of intelligence is... Uh, uh, so I think the combination of uh, bringing data together, managing the data better, mm-hmm. and having uh, kind of this intelligent piece of software, and that is a, a place where Gen AI plays into the stack as well. Sure. Uh, the combination of uh, the, kind of bringing the right data, asking the right questions, and understanding what is happening in the environment is going to be crucial. Because a lot more systems are now demanding of vendors to say, I don't want you to generate alerts that I have to now throw people at to investigate. Sure. I want your system. Why can't your system just tell me this is what happened? Right. Give me a c- complete narrative of what happened. Right. You touched it on, on a little bit uh, a few moments ago, you know, mentioning that more and more companies are looking to MSSPs. I was going to ask, you know, how, how does your uh, tools and what you guys are offering at Devo, how, how do you extend that to the masses? You know, the, the not enterprises, the MS, MSP. SMBs, you know, smaller companies. Yeah, we, we were not as much into the SMB space as I would say mid-tier uh, mm-hmm. companies, but okay. uh, so the, a lot of uh, MSSP, um, MSSPs use Devo as their backend uh, technology today. Right. Uh, we're very, we're a multi-tenant platform. We are completely in AWS cloud. So, and we are some of the secret sources that we're agnostic to data, so we can bring in data as quickly as possible right. at, at really high scales uh, at MSSP levels. Uh, so that we definitely see attraction. A lot more MSSPs are uh, using Devo to now protect their customers. Sure. Um, not as much, like I said, in the SMB space, but I think mid-tier and even the enterprise space, uh, I see a lot of traction there. So uh, edgy question, perhaps, but it, uh, for all the companies that don't have the infrastructure, the teams, the socks, but they need, they still need the same basic protection. Um, how do we get that to them? How can, how can they benefit from this type of technology and capability, but in a way that they can access yeah. it and afford it? Yeah, I think uh, see, one of the things uh, from a, a design perspective, some of the decisions we made makes us extremely cost effective okay. from, from a, a data management perspective. So that definitely helps. But then there's also, if you go below that tier, uh, we have a lot of MS, MSSP as well as MDR partners that we work okay. with. Uh, so we, we do take um, some of the customers who are not able to take advantage of these technologies directly. Mm-hmm. We just basically take them to one of our partners and say, hey, there is, there is a customer. And then we work with MSSPs behind the scenes to enable them to gotcha. have better security. I mean, I mean that, that is the best answer that there is to the question. You got to have third parties that are willing to focus and, and you know, divide up the costs. Yeah, exactly. you know, almost like uh, an insurance policy. Yeah. You know. The premiums get paid by thousands, with the expectation that not everybody has to benefit from. So we have customers who have thousands of tenants in our mm-hmm. uh, MSSP customers, as well as MDA customers. We have thousands of their tenants residing in Devo today. Great. Um, we're running down, running out of time. Uh, any parting messages? Any anything you want to let our audience know about how to approach you guys and what the, where they should start? Yeah, I think one or is open. <laughs> one of the questions I get asked is like, if you want to go pick a SIM, what is the right approach? What what, what should I look for in a SIM, et cetera? Mm-hmm. And I think, um, and there is also this notion that the SIM space is evolving extremely fast and we see a lot of uh, um, changes happening in the market, uh, especially uh, this year. Um, so one of the things I'm uh, seeing is that a lot of the SIMs are going to transition into a security data platform mm-hmm. where everything is, like I said, built into the system um, not uh, point pieces that you need to bring in. So True. look for uh, companies who are on that edge trying to build a security data platform 
uh, where uh, data orchestration is integrated, the SOAR capability is integrated, some of the uh, autonomous in investigation capabilities that I mentioned before is integrated, uh, UEBA, and it all has to work in tandem with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of the evolution of SIM that I see going forward. Mm -hmm. And if you look at some of the acquisitions that happened recently, it is trying to take kind of the two pieces of different technology or te technology vendors who are really good at one or the other piece and then bring them together to make the technology stack conversions go much faster. Uh, so that's my recommendation. Look for companies that are going from a SIM to becoming a security data platform and then uh, um, and tie up with them uh, as your uh, security partner. And whatever the choice, Devo's there uh, is the best. The data. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, that's going to do it for us today. Rakesh, thanks for stopping by and, and telling us about what the, is going on with Devo and how you're helping to keep companies secure. Um, that's going to wrap us for today, for this week. Uh, again, for information about Devo, go to securityweekly.com forward, security forward slash Devo BH. And for all the shows and interviews we had this week, go to securityweekly.com forward slash Black Hat. That's going to wrap us. There is an outro coming up and the final wrap, but this is the wrap for the interviews. So thanks for watching. We're here at the Four Seasons at Black Hat 2024. It is hot in Las Vegas because it's August and it's hot everywhere. Uh, I'm here this session talking to Reka Shinoy. Did I get it right? You got it. She is CEO of a company called Backbox. Welcome. Thank you. Oh, and I'm Jeff Mann. I'm host uh, co-host of Paul Security Weekly and host of this session. I always forget to introduce myself. Um, well, welcome. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background. How'd you, how'd you get to be CEO of a company? Uh, well, I'm excited to be here and talk with you with your stellar background, and I'll try to keep up, Jeff. Um, I've been in the cybersecurity business for about 20 years, started out as an engineer, um, went into product marketing and product management in uh, a whole bunch of different areas, saw uh, a lot of cybersecurity companies really grow and evolve and die and then come back. And, <laughs> and so it's been an interesting 20 years to see sometimes the technologies, what's old is new again. Uh, and more interestingly, to see how the, the landscape of, you know, of attacks and so on have evolved in that time. Uh, for myself personally, I love uh, taking new technologies to market and growing them, uh, but not because, you know, it's cool technology, but because it solves real world problems. And when I have an opportunity to find those kinds of rare jewels, it's really an honor to be part of that growth and to, uh, to succeed in that area. And a lot of what I've found over the years is, you know, that value trying to figure out where our CISOs are struggling and trying to add value to what the challenges are of today mm -hmm. uh, isn't always obvious. It's not just technology. And to be able to be part of this ecosystem is exciting. Currently at Backbox, uh, I am the CEO and we're really solving new problems that uh, once again, you know, uh, uh, keeping up with uh, how the, you know, the hacker landscape is evolving. Or the bad guy landscape. Because hackers are neutral. <laughs> That's true. That's true. You're right. Um, well, yeah, I've been I've been in this business for 40 years, and I like to go to the trade show floors and just kind of squint and blur my eyes. And, you know, it's all the same. It's like looking at school pictures, you know, classroom pictures of different people of different ages. It's like they're all identical, even though they could be 10, 20, 30 years apart from one end of the country to the rest. Um, so back box. Uh, you think you're solving problems. Um, what are the types of problems that you're seeing that, that Backbox is trying to, to tackle? So when you think about networks and, and uh, whether they're corporate networks, industrial networks, all the things we're trying to do with cloud and hybrid and work from home and all of those networks. Wait, the cloud is a network? <laughs> And, and, and when you think about all of those areas, we are continuing to evolve and, and scale and make more complex networks to support business needs. Right. And while we're doing that, you know, we've got AI going both on the good side and the bad side, adding complexity. Uh, you've got these hybrid environments with all this complexity. Meanwhile, the challenge of maintaining, remediating, and keeping these network devices secure is still in the dark ages. 
-hmm. You know, how do you do it? Well, you put people on it. You do manual work at midnight in off hours and you make changes one device at a time and you do this and hope that it doesn't go boom. You don't want to cause outages. So the, the challenge that our network engineers have in keeping up with vulnerabilities and keeping up with security in general, whether it's your security policy, whether it's your compliance policy and doing all of those things, that's still very much in the dark ages in terms of manual work. And why is it manual? Because you don't trust automation to not cause an outage. So in that world, here's Backbox, really an enterprise grade cybersecurity solution, bringing in cyber resiliency to that side of the fence. Every network engineer will tell you they're overworked. Mm -hmm. And when are they doing this work? They're doing it in their off hours, in overtime and things like that. How about we automate some of this in a way that gives them comfort, gives them confidence that it can be done, and gives them complete visibility to the work being done so that you're not doing this work manually. So we're in the business of automating the re the remediation of vulnerabilities, um, reducing that burden so that they can spend their time on more value-added activities, which is all that new network complexity that's coming their way. All right. So to clarify, you're focused on network devices. You're focused on the backbone, backbone, the architecture of enterprises, companies, yep, and providers and Ma managed and, service uh, providers. You know, yeah, you're suggesting that the cloud is there's a network behind the cloud, even though it's serverless and it's all software, it's still running on boxes that are running on a network that are connected. I'm starting to understand the name of the company, Backbox, a little bit. Uh, I, you know, I used to work for the DoD where we built little black boxes. So I think there might be something there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, <laughs> I've got so many stories, but this is your time. Uh, I used to work for a large um, telecom. Mm -hmm. And um, shortly after I went to work for them, uh, I was pulled in to help do a security evaluation of a project that they'd been working on where they had inadvertently taken out the network of what they were building, uh, a network that had to have 99.9999% uptime, and they took it down for like 18 hours. Uh, you know, somewhat similar to, but different to, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, a month ago, where a That's certain true. company, oh, I wasn't going to say the name. It's not really a security issue. It just happened to be a security company, but it was an IT issue, right. pushing out a patch and exactly. it broke things. And the 18 hours was there was a lot of remotely located networking gear that they had to like drive and find it and, you know, find the key to the door in this unmanned shed out in the, in the wilderness sometimes. Um, I guess my, what I'm leading up to is how do you get over the hurdle uh, of trusting automation? Okay, I guess that's my big question. Yeah, so uh, we'll start with enterprise grade backup and recovery being the core of the product. And okay. when we say enterprise grade, we don't mean just back it up and have the previous version there. It's got all of the version history. It's, it shows you what the changes were. It, mm -hmm. it captures it and you can restore to a known good state that you know it was. So the ability to have that at your fingertips is step one. Okay. Um, on top of that, the same system that has all of these automations for over 180 device manufacturers Manufacturers. Um, having all that automation in there that actually gives you the ability to go do a lot of these things. We also do configuration checks. So now we can go and look at all those configurations and find out what changed and, and automate the reconfiguration of those devices. On top of that, we now bring in intelligence around what the vulnerabilities are. If you think about vulnerability management as we've done, you know, you tend to think of Windows Patch Tuesday. Mm -hmm. That may be a mountain of work, but think about the amount of work if you've got hundreds of different device types in your organization. The first thing you're gonna do is spend all weekend trying to figure out four pieces of information. The device manufacturer, the device type, the device version, the firmware version. Mm -hmm. Then you correlate that against a vulnerability. No human should be spending their weekends reading all of that paperwork and correlating CVEs. Right. We do all of that for you. And when we identify it, we minimize the amount of work. And then we identify those that have active exploits against them in the wild. So we basically say, these are the ones you need to go worry about. So now we've taken that mountain of work and reduced it to the small subset that applies to you. 
Finally, we allow you to run that in a test environment and you come back, you've proven that this thing continues to run, it provides the availability that you need, and then you can deploy it to hundreds of devices. At that point in time, we, our traditional customer, will integrate with their typical workflow systems mm -hmm. and we will run these automations and we'll come back and we say 96 succeeded, four failed. So at that point, we've reduced the amount of work that a typical engineer would have done running these things manually or the work up front trying to figure out which of these patches apply and basically reducing it down to go take a look at these four devices that need to go get taken care of. The, cool. the ability to not think of automation as something that just does things in the night, but something that you have your hands on and it's doing exactly as you expect. We have customers on the telecom side. You mentioned that mm. uh, they're some of our favorite largest customers. We've got customers on the enterprise side. We've got managed service providers who rely on this every single day. Mm -hmm. And um, that, you know, and not just that, they are raving fans of ours. We love that part of it. And the reason is we've built an automation that they trust. Okay. It's interesting, and you're you're. It sounds like you're building at one customer, one satisfied customer at a time, and there's probably some word of mouth going on there. We've got about five hundred enterprise customers. Yes, and on shows like this to spread the word, yes, happy to do so, especially if the stuff works and it makes sense. Um, so there, there's there's work involved. There's there's interaction. I guess my first thought, as you were describing it, is, yeah. I work, my day job is a consultant advisor and I do, I do a certain type of compliance. I won't mm -hmm. mention it, but people that watch the show know, um, vulnerability scanning is part of the process. And I'm sitting here thinking, I don't know that I see a lot of vulnerability scans, at least in my limited sphere, um, that point a lot at the network devices, uh, you know, very often it's the servers and endpoints and workstations and other devices. Um, are you waiting for your clients to do some sort of vulnerability scanning to discover things or is discovery part of it's, what you're offering? We, well, both. So here's an important point that you mentioned, which is not only do not a lot of vendors provide the depth of vulnerability data on uh, network devices, a lot of times the vulnerability isn't even a CVE. Mm. It's not even in the National Vulnerability Database. Right. But they are published, they are available, they are being exploited, and they're being published by the device vendors. Right. So we not only pull all of the CVE data for all of these uh, network devices, we also pull it from the vendors. Mm -hmm. So whether there's a CVE or not, if the vulnerability has been published, mm -hmm. we are able to scrape it, find it, pull it in. And yes, we will pull that data and provide the customer that. Very important point that you just made. And I wish more people would get this, but the vulnerability management industry has made everybody think that it all starts with a scan um but it really and the the compliance that i do says just what you said you should have sources of vulnerability information that are the vendors the suppliers the mailing lists the news groups in the old days it was the bbs's and that type of thing whatever it is the, yeah. it is these days but you know word is on the street that there's a problem with a certain set of devices. I mean, on our show, on our weekly news segment, usually there's a half dozen stories about some networking hardware technology that, and there's certain ones that we like to pick on because they're in the news a lot because they right. have lots of problems. Um, but that's the type of thing that uh, is really should be the focus. I'm glad that you you, you clarified that. The thing that we found interesting, you know, adding to that point, now we have vulnerability vendors that just focus on servers. Then you've got some that cover it. But the bigger problem when I listen to the network management team is that there used to be this wall between security and networks. Mm -hmm. So this vulnerability scan was done by the security team and out comes flying a bunch of paperwork of go do these things. So right. there's this remediation thing. And then everyone tried to say, we provide you better risk, uh, you know, uh, ratings. So we will mark them critical, high, medium, low. Mm. But your critical is 16 pages long. So it really didn't do anything. It just gave me a mountain of work. Mm. So meanwhile, networks don't, network teams don't know what to do with this. They go like, I don't know which of these apply. You know, we're going through that exercise. And what we're finding is 
AI is actually breaking that wall in some ways. And the reason is, you know, used to be, and you know this, um, if a, if an exploit was available, usually it was weeks, months before, you know, that exploit was like easily available out there for someone to go do and was a real threat and was happening to your neighbors or your competitors. Right. Uh, now it's days because, you know, using AI, people are writing these exploits and then non-technical bad actors are able to take it and take advantage of it and right. get to you a lot faster. So anyone who's still living in the days of annual patches are out of luck. Right. Quarterly patches are sort of late, you know? So this idea of how is a network engineer ever going to catch up? They just don't. And so that's where we come in, where we can make it pragmatic, make it part of your everyday life and actually catch up to some of these things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the reason it's making more sense where I see more value is that security and networks are talking to each other because it's not just cyber awareness, cyber monitoring, it's cyber resilience. It's like our ability to be resilient to all the threats as they happen and to recover from these uh, is a priority and isn't just, uh, uh, you know, something that we just say, hey, we found it, we monitored it. You just don't get any credit for that anymore. Right, right. Fascinating. Uh, I want to learn more. But unfortunately, we're out of time for this segment, but I appreciate you coming and sharing a little bit about your vision with Backbox. Uh, if you've also had your interest peaked, you can learn more about Backbox by going to securityweekly.com forward slash Backbox BH for Black Hat at the end. That's going to wrap us for right now. Thank you very much. Thank you.